Good morning, Bethany Baptist Church. This is Mike Russell from the Hope Sunday School class. We'd like to wish all of you this week that are veterans a happy Veterans Day. And we thank you for your service that we might have this right of freedom here in America. Uh, so many of you have served and, and gave so much to this country. And so we, we honor you this morning with uh, our acknowledgement. Uh, we're going to look at our subject today is committed to pray. And we're going to look, the point is to pray for salvation and spiritual growth of others. And we're going to be coming from the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. And uh, our setting is going to be in the city of Colossal. And so uh, we know that Paul did not visit Colossians, but he had heard about what was going on there and the spiritual growth and gifts that came from it. Uh, you know, our lives look at things differently because all of us have different spiritual gifts and we learned that last week, and by using our spiritual gifts and the talents that God has given us, uh, we can do great things within our church and within our communities and within our state. Uh, and as we look at those aspects of it, uh, we are to intercede for each other in prayer that these talents and 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 spiritual growth is abound in each other through our asking the Father to strengthen us as we go through. Uh, let us go ahead and start with a moment of prayer and we will get started with the lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for life, health, and strength. We thank you for the opportunity to come one more time in your house and praise your name and learn of your word. Now, Father, we also thank you for our veterans uh, that gave up so much of their time and energy and sacrificed so much that we be free here in America, O oh, Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for our administrative staff and all of the uh, support staff that goes with them to run this great institution of Bethany Baptist Church, O oh, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the members of Hope Sunday School class and the other Sunday School classes that are in, unavailable to come to uh, church to hear the word, but we are using your technology to abound your people, O oh, Heavenly Father. We thank you again for this opportunity will be our prayer. Amen. All right, as we look this morning at commitment to pray for salvation and spiritual growth of others, we are going to meet some people that started the church in Colossae. And we know Paul had a lot of missionary journeys and where he went around establishing churches. But he did not establish the church in Colossae. Uh, he wrote a letter, which was a circular letter, that was supposed to be read there at the church and also into the neighboring cities of Laodicea and uh, Heropolis. And there were people there that were threatening the, the existence of the, and the integrity of the church that they were preaching, these uh, Gnostics that were preaching that there were so much other things that were involved in not following Christ. And Paul wrote this letter warning them not to be seduced by these false teachings. And one of the things about this letter is that Paul started this letter off just like he does all the other letters uh, of first uh, during that time of the century of a salutation where he included the names of a lot of the people that were involved in setting up churches and that were in the faith, such as Timothy and others. But 
The only pro problem that with this letter is that he followed this same format except for in the book, I mean, the letter that he sent to the Galatians. It was not the same type of letter. In this letter, it was a prayer of thanksgiving for their faithfulness, and also he prayed for their spiritual growth. His prayer becomes a worthy model for us to commit ourselves to pray for one another. And Paul showed us that we should pray for one another. Now, when we get to reading uh, Colossians 3 through 5, we see that he says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Well, we are to pray for thanksgiving for other believers. Paul uses as a primary aspect of this letter. He used the first person pure pronoun, we give thanks. We. Rather than the singular what? I. Because he was speaking of so many others that were praying for this church in Colossae. Paul's prayers were directed to God, who is the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He prayed an intercessory prayer for the Colossians. And you see that he, he said, for you, for you in this aspect. And he also said that word always. He captured it by using that we pray for you, what? Always. Uh, I want you to think about Paul for a minute. Paul had a prayer list that he used to guide his praying day in and day out. Have you made you, yourself a prayer list? That way you won't forget anyone. Paul used his prayer list and the Colossians were on that list. He thanked God for them. Uh, he always thanked God when he, we pray for one another. We thank God for each other. And we thank God for the talents that and the spiritual growth of each and every one of us. Paul praying was part prompted by having heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Paul did not visit Colossians, but he had heard of their faith there. And when he heard that, uh, he was told by others about this faith. And the term faith generally denotes the conviction of the truth of something. And this faith was being practiced there in Colossae. And in Colossae, their faith was there. And Paul was grateful to know just that they believed on Jesus, but the quality and character of their lives was being lived out in and through Jesus. It's one thing to believe in Jesus, but it's another thing to act upon him. And acting upon him is putting your faith into action. You know, they <clears throat> William E. Guest is a poet and he wrote this poem called I Rather See a Sermon Than to Hear One Any Day because he said that your tongue too fast may run. Seeing sermons is very impactful because in other words, you practice what you what? What you preach. And in preaching, people hear you, but they also want to see you, see what you do as well. See, he heard about the love, the love which you have for all the saints. To love means to act in terms of the best interest of another person. To love a person as a Christian is to seek, to enable him to become what God wants him to be. 
not what we want them to be. And in all of that, when we're giving hope to this aspect, we see that this hope that Paul is talking about in the next verse down here, it says, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. I want to talk about that hope aspect because last week we talked about this hope. And here we are again, Paul is mentioning this hope, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Well, you got to have faith that that hope is alive because that hope is an assurance. It's not something that others are hoping for or are wishing for. We don't have to wish for this. This is a term that tells us that through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have a guarantee. It's a certainty. It's not something that we wishing. But see, I hope you understand that there's a big difference between the word assurance and insurance. Insurance is like we take a policy out and it's a specified look or a specified period or it's a specified time, but it also deals with a thing called a premium. But see, our premium was paid a long time ago on that cross on Gotha Hill. Our guarantee in Jesus Christ gives us this hope. And so Paul goes a little farther with this hope. Paul goes a little farther in his triad that hope, faith, and love, those three. In the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he talks about hope, faith, and charity. Of these three, he says that love is the, be, uh, is, is the most. But without the hope, you wouldn't have the what? The faith and the what? Love. Those two come alongside. Hebrews 6, 9 tells us that which hope we have as an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast. So Paul gives us this. Jesus gives us also a guarantee. Jesus in the 14th chapter of John tells us that let not your heart be troubled. We believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, the way you know. But we have to understand that in order to get to this guarantee, there are some things that we must adhere to. And Jesus tells us that I am the truth and the life, and no man come to the Father but by me. So we know that in order to deal with this guarantee, we must believe and have faith in our Jesus. See, hope is not wishful thinking, but the certainty of a glorious life with Christ beyond the earth and into the eternity in heaven. And he goes on to say that the word of the truth of the gospel, and the gospel means the good news. And Paul relate more of this in verses six and eight about what they had heard the gospel and the significance of them hearing the gospel and their faith walk in Christ there in Colossians. So, what joy is, are we able to pray for with thanksgiving for those with whom we share a common faith in Christ? You know, during this pandemic, one of the things I miss most by not coming to church is also the Sunday morning prayer sessions that we had with the brothers 
before church. I miss that aspect of praying with those individuals that had the same common faith in Christ. When you're praying with others, no matter where you are, we have that common faith in Jesus Christ. It's uplifting. And we have to also understand that faith, love, and hope are the things that are rooted in the truth of the good news about Jesus Christ. And so as we look at verses 6 and 8, we begin to see that Paul got his information from somewhere. Where did Paul get this information about those individuals there at Colossians? Because it told us that he had heard. Well, verses 6 through 8 kind of gives us a clear view of what happened. Verse 6 says, which has come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. Since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, as you learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared us unto us your love in the spirit. Epaphras, he says here, was our dear fellow servant, a fellow servant to God and Jesus. Epaphras was more than likely someone that lived there in around Colossae. You know, Colossae is modern day Turkey. It's in that area of Turkey. And it was a trade city. And as years went by, the trade city of, of Colossus faded to Laodicea and Herothia. And so it diminished. But here it's telling us that we should pray for who, those who minister and spread the gospel. And Epaphras was one of the ones that really prayed and, start, and, and started that church there in Colossae. And we should pray for him is what Paul was saying. And we should also pray for our church leaders and those individuals that are leading us and, and, and giving up their time and effort. In your book, if you had your Sunday school book, it, it has steps in it. And it says that you should, one, pray for Thanksgiving, pray for those ministers, and then we also should pray for the salvation of others. Uh, and we continually see that even in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it tells us to pray. And we also should continue to pray for one another. And this validation of prayer is, is helping us to bring forth fruit as it do also in you. That this fruit that we bring forth multiplies when we give things over to God in prayer. And, you know, we, have to understand that the gospel confronts us. The good news of Jesus Christ confronts us and when it is preached, it confronts the hearers of the truth and the truth that results in our changed lives. Uh, it changes us and when we hear how do we get the gospel? First, we have to what? Hear the gospel. And it is no less true today than it was in those days, in those biblical days. Uh, the Colossians had experienced this powerful effect of the gospel since the day, they said, since the day ye heard of it. 
And it was a situation going on there in Colossal, just like in, in Galatians and, and uh, the other cities that Paul had founded churches. Uh, you had those Gnostics that were going around uh, false teaching and had the people in disarray. And the message that being modified to fit their whims of what they wanted and to make the message more popular or discredit those who originally proclaimed their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we, we have to understand that how did you hear this whisper of, of God talking to you? When did you become a faithful believer in Christ? It's because somewhere along the line, you heard the word, you heard the truth, and the truth is what sets us free. You know, we can only serve God in two ways, in spirit and in what? In truth. And I have I've understood that, you know, when I was young and now I'm old, but no one has ever seen the righteous forsaken. And that is the truth. Know the grace of God in truth. And we have to understand that aspect to understand that we have three things to do when we talk about understanding God in truth. We have to recognize him, we have to understand, and we have to experience the truth. And the truth was that God had acted in grace through who? Jesus Christ. And grace spoke of God's favor of giving what was not deserved to anyone who taught otherwise who declared that the additional actions, rituals, observances were required were false teachers with a false message. And so many of the people were following behind Paul and others preaching that believers had to be circumcised, they had to eat the right food, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. And it created problems for those. And Paul had to write letters and also go to Jerusalem to get that aspect straightened out. Now, Epaphras, as he said, our dear fellow servant, had learned the gospel and he had, he had to hear the gospel. And, and notice that there is progression in this aspect of hearing and learning the gospel. First, you had to hear it and the gospel to have its effect on you have to learn to know it, and then you have to learn it. See, the gospel is preached to be heard, and the gospel is to be internalized, to be known. In other words, you have to experience the gospel. It's just like life itself. You look for experiences because once you've gone through something, it's an experience that you can fall back on. Uh, riding a bicycle. You just didn't get on that bicycle and ride. You either had training wheels or you rode and you fell. And you learned that if I didn't keep my body in alignment, that I'm going to fall again. But over time, you see that you continue to ride that bicycle to the point to where you stayed upright. That came through experience. So many of us had driver's license and, and learning to drive. It was a lot of curves probably was ran over. It probably took hours and hours of parallel parking to get your license. But guess what? You got them because you learned or you experience those aspects. Uh, 
The gospel is like that. The gospel is, has to be internalized into an experience. And then the third thing says that the gospel is to be taught, to be learned. See, as Sunday school teachers, and all, and, and all of us can adhere to this, that regardless of what we teach and, and what age group we teach, you learn more by teaching than you do reading and studying yourself. And a lot of times when we're up here teaching the lessons, we're not just teaching you, we're teaching ourselves because we are being convicted by the word just as much as you are being convicted by this word. And so we find that we got to hear it, we got to know it, we got to learn it. And as we go through God's experiences and, and learning, we find that our faith grows. And we, Paul knew this, and he continued to lean on Epaphras, and he felt the kinship with him because of the gospel and in knowing the things that he was going through. And uh, he prayed for Epaphras and that church as servants of the same master, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, move on over a little bit. We find that Paul also declared unto us love each other in the faithful ministry and also love each other in spirit. And Epaphras was the minister there at the church in Colossae. Uh, he prayed for him. And we should also pray for our administrative leaders here in our church as well. You know, Paul doesn't explicitly talk about Colossians, uh, pray for Epaphras. Uh, but he also talked about praying for faithful ministers of Christ. But, and this word but, certainly such praying is warranted. See, we are to pray for the protection and the diligence of church leaders in carrying out the call of God has made on their lives to preach, teach the gospel, because the message in all is truth, in all of its power, so that others, just as Colossians, will live in faith, love, hope, found only in Christ. And see, we want to look at Deuteronomy 4.2. Deuteronomy 4.2 tells us that you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish out from it. You don't add and you don't detract from the word. And I pray that our ministers continue to follow that pattern of what God has told them to do. Preach the word in season and in out of season. Preach it instantly and, and continually in prayer with that aspect. And in doing so, we pray that you live a faithful, loving, and hopeful life that you can only find in our Christ Jesus. In verses 9 through 12, we see that it reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being faithful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You know, that aspect that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Uh, you know, just because we are doing well right now doesn't mean that we are all right. Uh, we still need prayer. You know, sometimes if somebody's had a situation of uh, a demise of a loved one or an accident, we're, we're going to pray for them. But what about those individuals that 
you haven't heard from that seem to be doing okay. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray for those individuals just as much as we pray for those that are going through something. Because, you know, we are just like sheep. You know, the sheep follows the herder, sheep herder, the shepherd. But sheep will follow anything. Sheep will follow and go off astray just as easily as anybody. And so, and even when the sheep would go off astray, the, the herder had this hook on his cane that he would pull that sheep and break his leg and put him on his shoulders and carry him because if he kept running off. You know, when I think back of sheep running away, I keep thinking about my youngest son, Marcus. When he was small, he would always slip off. And, you know, I would tap his little legs all the way back to the house and, and 30 minutes later, he's gone again. So we had to break that habit because we didn't know where he was going. So we had to wind up, make him stay in his room for a week. And it was okay in the room playing with the toys or when the other kids came by, the neighbor's kids came by and played with it. But when they left the house to go ride their bikes and, and play in other aspects in each other's yard, oh boy, did it, it tear him up because he couldn't go. And so that finally brought him around to understanding that he just couldn't run off. So I understand sheep, sheep, and we can be like sheep. Uh, knowing God's will is also a priority that we pray for, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. See, we may not be worthy of what the Lord gives us, or what he's done for us, but he is worthy of everything we offer to him. Uh, Paul defined a uh, walk worthy of the Lord means the balance of the prayer framing, his thinking around these four participles, being fruitful, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthen, and giving thanks. And each goal is to be achieved that comes from knowing God's will and determined by the commitment by the believer. Now, being fruitful in every good work, good works are not the way of salvation, but they are a product of salvation. Believers who would live a manner of life that is suitable for one who is in Christ will produce actions in upright and honorable. Increasing in the knowledge of God intended here is that just knowing about God but knowing God in the sense of a personal, intimate relationship with him so that their lives are filled with him. And the more of God, know more of Jesus. To know more of God, we have to know more of Jesus. And we can be able to bear fruit consistent with the life committed to him. And then we look at strengthening all our might, and being patient and long-suffering with joyfulness. Well, living a manner that has become to the Lord will sometimes be a path filled with many obstacles. And we endure these challenges while continuing to move forward in faith. Long-suffering is the capacity to be patient with people and not immediately retaliate when things go wrong. No, last week we said that we must rejoice in our affliction because afflictions produce endurance. And our endurance uh, provide, prove, provides proven character. And proven character produces hope. And a Christian's hope is knowing that God is what? Faithful. You know, giving thanks to the Father is one thing that we have to make sure we understand. That with God, time is nothing to him. Uh, you know, our prayers offered up years ago 
will come to fruition. God answers all prayers. You know, Oswald Chambers says that God answers our prayers with silence. It doesn't mean that he didn't answer. He's in silent mode. And I think about my grandmother praying and, and grandfather praying for us to have a better life. And they have gone on, but yet and still, God is still answering those what, prayers. We came over on our parents' prayers and our foreparents' prayers. And God answers all prayers. But see, we want to be in this instant society where we pray for something today and we want it by this afternoon. God doesn't work in that manner. That is for the unbeliever to those that don't believe. He is constantly being there. Silence is golden when we pray. And John 1.32, John, 1 John 3.22 tells us whatever we ask for, we receive from him. And see, again, Oswald Chambers tells us that when we pray, we must be honest and eager in our prayer. One wonderful thing about God's stillness is connection with him through prayer is that God makes us still, makes us perfectly confident that he will answer our what, prayers. Well, Joseph Skirvin wrote, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And when he wrote that, he said that, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And Paul sums it up best in Romans 12, 12. We should rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. And continually, instantly in prayer. And at that note, we are going to stop here and offer up a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today on prayer, that we should pray for one another, O Heavenly Father, as you prayed for us. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that your son gave for us on Calvary's cross. We thank you for this opportunity again to worship and praise your holy name. We thank you and, and ask, O oh, Heavenly Father, that you go with those individuals that are sick and shut in, O oh, Heavenly Father. And Father, we know that you give hope, assurance that we will have a right to the tree of life by believing and being faithful to your Son. We know that you are faithful, O oh, Heavenly Father, even when we are not faithful. So God and protect us. This week will be our charge. We ask these things in your son Jesus. Amen.